is armed. Repeat, the chair is armed. The inner chamber is now Hi, welcome to Around the World in 80s Movies. My name is Vince Leo. I am the author of the film review website, Quipster.net. I've been doing film reviews for 25 years as of this recording, and you can find all of my written work at Quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. While you're there, you can find the link to my other podcast called To the 90s and Beyond. Very similar to this one, but of course, I cover films of the 1990s and beyond. Some more recent movies as well. You can find all of that at quipster.net. Today I'm going to be getting into the second part of this three-part series, looking at films of the 1980s in which electricity, or an evil manifestation of electricity, is the main nemesis. Pulse preceded this one, but we're going to go into another film featuring an evil that could get into the circuits within the home and into appliances as well with Shocker from 1989. Shocker is an R-rated film. It does have strong, bloody violence, disturbing content, and language. The runtime is an hour and 49 minutes. The main stars are Peter Berg and Mitch Pileggi, with Michael Murphy, Cami Cooper, Richard Brooks, Sam Scarber, John Tesh, and Ted Raimi also in the film. Wes Craven is the director as well as the screenwriter for Shocker. Now, the inspiration for Shocker began when Wes Craven was working back in 1986 on another film called Deadly Friend. And while he was at lunch with his editor, Michael Elliott, Elliott mentioned that he really loved the premise of that 1951 chiller called The Thing from Another World. And he suggested that Craven should make a movie where there's a monster who is able to hide among different human hosts. And that's something that really did appeal to Craven. He did view horror as originating from anxiety that was caused by feeling like you were losing one of the two most important houses in everybody's life, the house that you grew up in and your physical body. And Craven liked the idea of evil being able to go into anybody because that really fostered the notion that evil exists anywhere. Craven and Elliot began to develop that concept eventually into a psychodrama that featured this serial killer who made a deal with the devil just prior to his execution. The killer transforms after his electrocution into an electrical entity with the ability to enter people's bodies through their electromagnetic nervous system. And after conceiving this villain, they developed a hero, a psychic, but not one that the cops would readily believe. Craven thought, well, maybe like a gifted child, but later would settle on a football player, a jock who has visions of the murders as they happened. He was an eyewitness to the events, but not physically present there, so not something that they could really use in court. He would either have to find a way to get that physical evidence, or he'd have to stop the killer himself. Craven fleshed out this premise under the title Dream Stalker and he developed it for the Fox Television Network to be a weekly series where the killer would control a new person every week. And the only person who knew where and when that murder was going to take place was the psychic. But after a year of tinkering with this premise, Fox unfortunately reconsidered. This was a show where somebody gets away with murder every episode. That seemed too negative for this burgeoning network to try to take such a risky gamble that the public would accept this. Craven wasn't terribly dismayed yet. He was too invested in his next film project, The Serpent and the Rainbow, to really want to get involved in watering down this concept enough for Fox to try to slot it into their primetime lineup. Besides, during the making of Serpent and the Rainbow, Craven's assistant, Marianne Maddalena, she mentioned that the Dreamstalker premise had just been made into a theatrical film from New Line called The Hidden coincidentally directed by Jack Shoulder, who also directed the second Elm Street film. If you listen to my episode on that sometime earlier, this is the one where an, a murderous alien parasite controls humans to commit murder and mayhem. Now, following Serpent and the Rainbow's success, Craven received a lot of offers to develop new projects from various producers and studios, including MGM, 
And Craven expressed, though, growing fatigue at being harassed by studios. He was just tired of having to compromise his vision time after time by people who didn't even know anything about the horror genre. While he was discussing this with his agents, they mentioned that there was a deal that they had secured for another client of theirs, John Carpenter, and that deal gave him full creative control and distribution through Universal Pictures in the U.S. and Kuroko overseas. So Craven was interested in that deal, and he soon entered into a similar four-picture deal, two horror films with an option for two of any genre, with Shep Gordon and Andre Blaze Alive Films. For final cut on his upcoming movies, if they could be made on time and under the $5 million budget and would test well with preview audiences. Shep Gordon from Alive Films, he suggested that Craven create his next Elm Street for them. But now, unlike with New Line, Craven could retain the rights to his characters. And Craven embraced that arrangement because this meant no more haggling over casting choices, adding jump scares where they didn't belong, gratuitous nudity or gore also where they didn't belong, and he didn't have to compromise his ending to allow for a sequel like he did with New Line. So Alive slotted his next film for an October release to capitalize on Halloween horror movie watching. Now he just had to figure out what he wanted to do. So for his first film, Craven returned to that dream stalker idea that he could never get made. So in this case, he was going to reconceptualize that concept as his next Nightmare on Elm Street. Craven at this point was so bitter that he had ceded the rights to Freddy Krueger to New Line Cinema to get the first Nightmare on Elm Street made, and he was so sick of seeing what they did with his character that he just wanted to bury Freddy and make a better version of him, someone who was not this non-intimidating jokester that he had become in the sequels. Shecky Green with Claws, that's how Craven dubbed what Freddy had become. Craven retitled Dreamstalker to reference his scarier version of Freddy, No More Mr. Nice Guy. That was from the Alice Cooper song. Shep Gordon happened to be Alice Cooper's manager, so obviously he loved that title. But for legal reasons, Craven could not make his villain look like Freddy. He couldn't have similar powers, no traveling in dreams. He also felt that he had to distinguish his premise from that other New Line film, The Hidden. So he added the power to his villain to travel through the electrical grid. He could go into wall circuits. He could go into any devices plugged into the wall sockets, including the television set, then that gave him another great idea because Craven had read this scientific book analyzing how people's brain waves while they were watching television, they were like in a hypnotic state that closely resembled those experienced while humans dreamt. So Craven here with the television had his new way of bringing back Freddy without actually bringing him back. He additionally added that his villain could navigate through television waves. So basically he could be almost anywhere where television waves existed. So this angle also appealed to Craven's penchant for wry commentary because he felt that TV was the one thing that really pushed this notion of the American dream, not just one person's dream. TV was a mirror into human society, but also through its dark lens, it showcased humans' thirst for violence, with war, with strife, perpetually on the news every night. Growing up during World War II, Craven knew that horror films were a way to cope with the world's evils that we experience. Television, though, is a Trojan horse. It goes into everybody's homes. It brings the world's violence to our family's eyes. And the villain within this would be a symbol of television's evil. Shot in a warehouse in downtown Los Angeles rather than a soundstage to save money. The film is set in Ohio. That's where Craven's from. He drew from characterizations based on people that he knew while he was living there. Craven dubbed his new villain Horace Pinker. Horace would be a television repair technician, and he would treat his occupation as some sort of spiritual journey. He would perform rituals to his electronic gadgets as some sort of deal that he would enter with the devil, so to speak. As payment for his human sacrifices to these electrical appliances, Horace's eventual execution in the electric chair would not kill him so much as make him stronger. Now, Craven's protagonist for this film was going to be, as he was going to be in the original TV series, a college football star. He would be named Jonathan after Craven's own son. Jonathan would be tied to the killer through this hereditary link 
that drives his quest for revenge. Jonathan experiences horrifically vivid hallucinations following a concussive collision with a goalpost, and his first vision depicts the murder of his foster mother and siblings. When Jonathan awakes, he finds that this dream actually did happen. His foster family, except for his father, who's a lieutenant on the police force, happens to have been murdered. And he's an eyewitness, but he wasn't physically there, and that leaves the cops skeptical. Jonathan realizes that his visions are a telepathic link to the murderer, Horace Pinker, which he was going to use to thwart the next murder in this Midwestern town of Maryville before Horace kills again. Horace gets caught, and his verdict is death by electrocution. Before Pinker sits in the electric chair, though, he makes a Faustian deal in his jail cell to a television set that allows him to live on after the would-be fatal experience as an entity of electricity, and he can channel into any electrical network, and that includes people's bodies or the power grid or pretty much anything plugged into a wall socket, including televisions from coast to coast. After Horace reveals himself to be Jonathan's biological father before his execution, he makes a violent escape afterward, only this time he can be anywhere or anyone, and only his son's psychic powers might be able to stop his bloodthirsty rampage. So Horace was going to be the new Freddy, but the question was, who would be the next Robert England? Craven felt that an actor who played Horace had to be charismatic as England, although he would have to have a different vibe or it would be too obvious he was making a Freddy clone here. Hundreds did audition, including, notably, Mick Fleetwood. Craven rejected Mick Fleetwood because of his longtime association with the soft rock supergroup Fleetwood Mac. He didn't think that people would truly buy that he had no limits. The only quality, though, that he looked for among the actors was that he would know him when he saw him. Craven knew it when Mitch Pileggi walked in, although he actually didn't audition initially for the Horace Pinker role. He was actually going for the football coach. Despite that, Pileggi was called back to audition with Craven and Madalena, his producer, but this time they wanted to see him audition for Horace. Pileggi, as he went through audition, he knew that he was doing something very convincing because Madalena physically began to distance herself for safety as if she was actually frightened of what he might do. Two weeks later, Pileggi came back because they wanted to see if he could handle the physical aspects of the Horace Pinker role. Madalena, again, during this audition, distanced herself yet again. He felt, if anything, he had one person at least completely convinced, but not just one person. Craven was also convinced. Craven gave him not only the part, but also added additional dialogue to Horace Pinker because he wanted to compliment Pileggi's excellent acting skills. Now, the Horace Pinker scenes weren't among the first ones shot, so while awaiting his scenes, Pileggi started to work on what was supposed to be Horace Pinker's trademark limp, and he came up with one that he thought was so fantastic, Craven was going to love it, but then when he came in to do his part, he found that they had already filmed scenes with a little girl that Pinker takes over, So Pileggi, instead of doing the one that he had worked on for a couple of weeks, had to model his limp after the one she used, which was very emphatic. For the role of Jonathan, Craven hired Peter Berg. If that name sounds familiar to you, well, he's been an actor for a long time, but a lot of people know him today because he's directed several notable films, including Hancock, Lone Survivor, Deepwater Horizon, The Kingdom, The Rundown. I mean, a, a lot of very popular action films that have comedy. Patriot's Day, I mean, you can, I could go on and on. But Peter Berg, he was a little old for the part, really. He was only 12 years younger than Mitch Pileggi, who is supposed to be his father, I guess, in this film. Now, Craven wanted a love story component to foster his belief that love is eternal, even beyond death, so he created a girlfriend character for Jonathan. Her name he called Allison, and she would be played by Cammie Cooper. Now, Craven, he originally had intended to make this a very dark film, but after he started injecting these themes of love being stronger than hate, he started to lighten the tone of his movie with a lot more humor and a dash of romance. So many of the scenes that were originally intended to be downright terrifying and nasty were now played for some dark comedy laughs. For instance, Pinker does take over that body of that seven-year-old girl who suddenly turns into a potty mouth psycho for our entertainment, the one that developed the limp. Michael Murphy took the stepfather role, the cop, 
Lieutenant Don Parker. After reading the script, he found it hilariously droll. It seemed like an exuberant send-up of the horror genre. He thought it would be clever and make for a very fun ride with a lot of thrilling moments punctuated by this refreshing tongue-in-cheek attitude that Craven added. Craven also would add a lot of cameos to this film. Timothy Leary, he plays this televangelist. Entertainment Tonight host John Tesh, he plays the TV news anchor. Craven even added members of his family. His daughter Jessica plays a girl behind the counter toward the early part of this film. His son Jonathan, the one that the protagonist is named after, he plays a jogger. Jonathan also happened to have assisted in the editing during post-production for this film. There are additional cameos, Alice Cooper, Elm Street's Heather Langenkamp, kind of a tongue-in-cheek joke for Freddy fans as one of the first victims, Ted Raimi, I mentioned earlier, Sam's brother, by the way, Brent Spiner, briefly as a talk show guest, and frequent collaborator with Craven, Bruce Wagner, is the executioner, and Wes Craven himself puts himself in as a neighbor who asks, was that real? Toward the end of the film, the optical effects were done by Max Headroom's Bruno George, who'd worked with Craven for uh, about three episodes of the Twilight Zone TV revival during the mid to late 1980s. George had also been working with Craven for the short-lived 1989 TV series called People Next Door, which was one of the first cancellations of the 89 to 90 season. Craven's cinematographer from A Nightmare on Elm Street also came aboard here, Jacques Haitken, who also worked on The Hidden, by the way. Haitken designed shots around Pinker's transformational segments by shooting to videotape, and then that was going to be placed within the film. Because video contains less information than film, though, Haitken had to shoot his footage as very clean and bright and sharp as possible to minimize grain and to allow for Bruno George's matte effects to be placed within the film footage. Shooting to video had grown very popular on television during this period, so Craven thought it made sense for Pinker to exist in video textures when he would be leaping into the airwaves. Craven immediately envisioned this fight within television, using all of the real-life violence that is depicted in our culture as the backdrop to the struggle between good and evil. Craven also explores TV's narcotic influence by having that Timothy Leary as a televangelist. Now, Pinker, because he makes his escape during his execution, he wears this orange prison jumpsuit. That becomes his trademark, and that was chosen because he felt, like Freddy, he needed to have that iconic look, but also it contrasted well with the matte optical effects that we're planning to put in here. But Craven did have a late setback because Bruno George, he ended up not being able to deliver on the opticals that he promised. George's idea to transfer film to video and then back again with mats removed was not going to work as he had intended. It didn't function. So when he was finally confronted about this, George broke down into tears. He nearly suffered a mental breakdown from the guilt and the feeling of anxiety that he had had that this film might be derailed because of him. So Craven took immediate action. He tried to salvage whatever negatives of the film that he had to try to make something workable with only a month to go, but everything was a mess. There were pieces of the negative that were in the lab, they were in George's car, they were mixed among a lot of negatives from other projects that he was working on. So Craven would need new opticals, but he had absolutely no time to hire anybody to come in and start from scratch. So he had to parcel it out piecemeal to various effects houses to try to recreate each particular piece that would be used in the film. And that greatly expanded, by the way, the budget to the point where Craven actually had to pay out of his own pocket for the difference. I've been avoiding saying the title of Shocker throughout this because throughout most of this, No More Mr. Nice Guy was the working title that they were intending to release this as. But you know that did hit a little too close to home. And that primarily was because No More Mr. Nice Guy also happened to be the title of the first episode of the 1988 TV show called Freddy's Nightmares. So Freddy Krueger already kind of had <laughs> a tie-in to that title. So it would make it too obvious yet again. So they brainstormed new titles and they settled on eventually Shocker for its double meaning. They toyed with actually keeping No More Mr. Nice Guy as the secondary title. So Shocker, No More Mr. Nice Guy, but Universal who had a distribution deal with Alive Films, wanted to avoid any chances that they were going to be sued by New Line. So another snag did occur because in April of 1989, 
in theaters was the release of another movie called The Horror Show, and that also featured a serial killer whose execution makes him supernaturally powerful. He can also travel through electricity. And The Horror Show happened to be made by Craven's friend and one-time collaborator on The Last House on the Left, Sean Cunningham. Craven, because Cunningham was a friend, he wouldn't criticize him publicly, but he was privately very livid. Not only that he felt Cunningham may have stole his idea, but that registering his idea for Shocker with the Writers Guild did not sufficiently protect him from somebody else coming out with the same premise. So Craven did take Cunningham at his word eventually that that idea had been developed independently, even though there were a lot of very striking similarities. And he also hoped that the competition was going to do no more damage to Shocker than Dreamscape happened to do to a very similarly premised A Nightmare on Elm Street back in 1984. Once it was all said and done during post-production, Craven realized that Shocker, yeah, it just wasn't going to be as good as he had envisioned. It just wasn't popping the way that he thought. And the reason why it was revealed in test screenings, where it was revealed kind of a psychological flaw in Craven's plan to use video textures for his climax, because audiences they didn't seem to treat video images with the same weight as they did film, and the impact was deadened. So, Craven's initial idea for a plasma-like transparent appearance to Horace Pinker when he's driven from a human body and looking for another host, that didn't seem to grab audiences as well as they might. They looked a little too inauthentic. So Craven determined he had to change the appearance to have a little bit more opaqueness to this. So Craven redid the ending where there's a bedroom fight in which the combatants enter a TV screen and the battle plays out in a video image and he changed it so that Jonathan would freeze Pinker in midair and then after he dissolves he'd return back to film to have a more impactful climax henceforth. So once Craven finally fixed that issue, another obstacle, perhaps the biggest obstacle to getting his film released on time came about. The MPAA bestowed shocker an X rating, or NC-17. It forced Craven to perform last-minute edits because his contract with Alive stipulated that his films could not be stronger than R-rated. So after several passes with additional cuts, the MPAA still continued to not budge on their initial rating of NC-17. They claim that the film is just too intense, and they were concerned that children might actually be able to see it. Craven fired back that it was his job to deliver an intense horror film. The ratings board decision meant that no filmmaker would be allowed to make movies to entertain adult horror fans, adult horror fans who knew fantasy from reality. So Craven submitted a formal complaint. He called it his constitutional right as an artist to make R-rated movies without having to worry about this fantasy child who might see his film. Craven complained that there was a bias from the MPAA against anything labeled as horror specifically, and he grew frustrated that Shocker repeatedly met with an X rating, so to speak, and that the ratings board was providing no guidance as to what it was that was pushing his film over the line so that he could trim it to make it an R. The MPAA's only response was it was intense, and he didn't know exactly what that meant. The MPA's response to his formal complaint was that, hey, he didn't have to take it to them. He could release his film uncut and unrated if he wanted to. However, unrated or NC-17 or X-rated films could not be advertised in most newspapers, and TV stations wouldn't allow commercials, and very few theaters would even screen films that were harder than R. And this presented an undesirable situation to many directors who considered themselves artists. They either had to release their uncut vision and suffer short financial disaster, or they would have to cut their film to the MPAA satisfaction, and that would merely demonstrate that money is more important than art. So it took over a dozen attempts for Craven to cut enough of Shocker to satisfy the rating board. The scene that Craven most regretting that he had to tone down was one where Pinker bites off the fingers of a prison guard. He spits them out and gleefully quips, finger licking good. That line is still in the film, but we don't see the fingers being spit out of the mouth. Test audiences, though, did love that particular moment, and Craven felt that that moment was critical because we needed to view Pinker as an absolute maniac so that we would dread what other horrors might erupt, other unpleasantries, as it were. 
Craven is a believer that horror has to cross lines to scare audiences. For instance, The Exorcist established early that it was willing to go places no other prior horror film dared, and audiences were absolutely on edge throughout the rest of that film because they, they didn't know exactly what they were going to see from scene to scene. Craven also had to remove shots of Pinker's electrocution, especially his full body twitching around, and, and the gruesome discovery of the body of one of the characters in a bathtub. He also excised a shot of Coach Cooper, under the influence of Pinker, stabbing his own hand with a knife. Craven found all of these MPAA demands so insulting that he actually contemplated quitting movie making altogether a few years afterward as he continued to deal with them. But he eventually got his R-rated cut, He's grown to be satisfied, even though he feels that his uncut vision probably would have worked much better. Now, the other thing that was going to sell Shocker was going to be the soundtrack, and that included a lot of heavy metal acts like Megadeth, Iggy Pop, Alice Cooper, uh, a kind of a super group, The Dudes of Wrath, which contains Alice Cooper from Kiss, Paul Stanley, Tommy Lee from Motley Crue, among a few others. Megadeth covered the Alice Cooper classic No More Mr. Nice Guy because that was going to be the theme song. They did a music video even for that, directed by Penelope Spheris. Now, Craven did come to regret committing to the heavy metal soundtrack that was written by Shep Gordon's close friend, producer Desmond Child, which he felt uncomfortably fit his story. He liked the more traditional score that was in the film. Desmond was very well connected, and he brought in nearly all of the talent for the song, so by the time Craven realized that it really wasn't the vibe he wanted, it was too late for a new score. But despite Craven's qualms about it, many fans of Shocker do cite the metal tracks as one of the reasons they actually really like the film. Now, if Pinker represents violence within our society as viewed through television, then his execution was going to make him stronger. Despite the death penalty in effect for decades, human society has only grown more violent, so that makes sense. Pinker is the representation of TV violence resulting from real-world violence. The images viewed on television are of real-world wars and real-world killings. Jonathan represents breaking from that cycle of violence, asserting that he is not like his father and doesn't need to go down the same road. And Craven says that Shocker was kind of a personal film to him because it was a way to exercise his feelings toward his own hot-tempered and abusive father. Now, when Shocker was released, it was, I guess, profitable. It earned $16.5 million domestically off of its $5 million budget, even though Craven did have to kick in a little bit more than that to get it ultimately made. But it did finish under the $22 million earned by A Nightmare on Elm Street 5. That was considered a disappointment, so Shocker didn't even make that in 1989. So as such, Universal was very tepid on continuing with this as a horror franchise. They felt that the possibilities just didn't seem to be there. Although, for some reason, Shocker reportedly was a very big hit in South America. Now, many people do attribute the authorship of Freddy Krueger to Craven. Horace Pinker, maybe, he's just too reminiscent to Freddy to avoid being called a clone. It This very much has a vibe and a spirit, and, and Horace Pinker, especially the way that he quips throughout this film, will absolutely remind people of the Nightmare on Elm Street series. I think the only difference is that Freddy kills through dreams, Pinker through TV and appliances, although in a very similar fashion. Also, by this point, the realm of homicidal maniacs was already overpopulated, yet many viewers were already growing tired of the cycle of slasher films. Freddy, Jason, Michael, these are all big names in the slasher movie industry, but the industry was waning by this period. The movies were definitely not nearly as profitable as they once were, so Shocker may have been way too late to the party for Horace Pinker to become one of the Mount Rushmore's of slasher movie villains. Shocker does have its clever ideas here and there, but its lack of logic does leave it playing, oftentimes like a very ultra-violent version of a cartoon. You know, Craven did try to throw in some satire here, but I think what mars it is the blatant imitation. Craven seems to be much more focused on retreading Freddy and making Horace Pinker his replacement for fans and trying to play to that crowd instead of trying to turn to new channels for inspiration. The attempts at humor here, they don't yield nearly as many laughs 
as probably intended. And the satire, unfortunately, by the time it's all said and done on television, barely does leave the mark that you would hope for. There is also a weakness here in that the weakness of Pinker is also a weakness for the movie. There's this love story that doesn't really generate any real romantic feelings whatsoever. The tragedy that we're supposed to feel for that particular story just is not as evident there. Despite some very good visuals through this film, the heart-shaped necklace that's kind of like love being the antithesis of Horace Pinker, the embodiment of hate, uh, just doesn't generate the kind of qualities that you would look for. And unfortunately, I think, shocker, despite good visuals and despite some interesting and sometimes amusing notions, just never quite coalesces into a truly satisfying whole. And that's why I can only give Wes Craven's Shocker two and a half stars out of four. Two and a half stars on my scale means that it had the tools, it had the talent to be something more, something more worthwhile. But I think that in trying to replicate what Craven did to try to capture lightning in a bottle yet again, which is almost an impossibility, I think People had already seen Craven do this before, and they weren't going to just allow him to rip off Freddy just because he had created him. He had to show something more, and unfortunately, people viewed A Nightmare on Elm Street as a better film all around, even if the sequels fell short, even of Shocker in the end. So, two and a half stars is the best I can give Shocker, despite respecting Craven and what he was trying to do anyway. Now, elements of the original concept for the Dream Stalker did appear in this 1990 NBC TV show that Craven did called Night Vision. That show also happened to feature Mitch Pileggi. So some of the leftover ideas did manage to make it finally to television screens, even though he was ridiculing television all throughout this film. There was also talk about maybe they should do a follow-up to Shocker, maybe with a smaller budget, having a new director, Craven would just executive produce it. In 2009, Craven did announce that he would executive produce a Shocker sequel that was going to be written and directed by Bruce Wagner. That was as close as he ever came was that announcement. It never did quite get off the ground at all. Eventually, uh, a protege of Wes Craven, Nick Simon, he contemplated doing a return of Shocker, but never did manifest into something. Will it ever get remade? Well, I don't know. If the cult audience for Shocker has not developed beyond hardcore West Craven fans, I don't think there is a viability, a big demand among the general public to see Horace Pinker don his orange jumpsuit yet again and scare us. I think Freddy Krueger just takes up all the oxygen in the room when it comes to that sort of thing. So enjoy it for what it is, Craven fans. If you have your own thoughts on Shocker and you want to write to me, you can find all of my contact information at my website. That's at quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. Links to my Twitter feed, Facebook page, Instagram. Email is the best way to get in touch. As far as what I'm going to be talking about next, well, you may be a step ahead of me. I did mention this film during the body of the review for Shocker. From 1989 as well, it is that film that came out in April of 1989 and reportedly stole some of the thunder that Craven had intended for Shocker. It's called The Horror Show, part of the House series of films, House 3, but it actually is a standalone film. And I will talk about that as a standalone feature for the next episode. The Horror Show, featuring Lance Hendrickson and Brian James. And until then, thank you so much, everyone, for listening and joining me on this trip around the world in 80s movies.